Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to sincerely thank the organizers of this prestigious international symposium on the cultures of Africa and people of African descent who have honored me with this inaugural conference. It is also an honor bestowed upon my institution of affiliation, the Sheikh Anayib University of Dakar, as well as upon the Laboratory of African and post Studies, of which I am the director. Ladies and gentlemen, dear speakers, dear participants from across the world, all those who are interested in African and diaspora studies, my talk is on the following subject. Africa, the African diaspora, and the rest of the world, mutual understanding from the inside. We all dare hope that this inaugural conference, as well as the others that will follow, all focus on the central theme of this second CICAF International Symposium, cultural diversity in an interconnected world, a response to the realities and challenges of the of Afro-descendant communities will undoubtedly lay new groundwork which will make future editions of the specialized conferences some of the most popular ones in the Africanist scientific world. Ladies and gentlemen, before I get to the heart of the matter, I would like to make sure that we all are on the same page, on the same wavelength, with regard to the concept of my topic. By Africa, I mean Africa south of the South Sahara, which is a set of socio-political entities that some would call Black Africa, and whose multi-secular cultural unity, eminent researcher Chef Atayo has rightfully or wrongfully proclaimed by the African diaspora without excluding anybody or any recent social, economic, and cultural entity from Africa and present outside the continent, please understand all the social, political, and cultural formations that were born from the deportation from the continent of Africa to the other continent, especially into the Americas, of African population from the 16th century to the abolition of slavery in the 19th century. By the rest of the world, we mean all the social, political, and cultural entities on the five continents with which Africa and its diaspora have been having problems political problems, economic problems, cultural problems for centuries of turbulent context. And with a focus on Western, on the Western world in all its components. By mutual understanding, what do we mean? And from the inside, without any exaggeration, I think, like I may say, I think that I may say that I understand, I appreciate, and I respect the West because since my childhood in my native village in Senegal, I have been in direct contact with the West through its French school, its languages, French and then English, its democracy and its values imposed upon me. Africa, other Africans, and people of African descent also understand, I believe, at least quite well, the West, Westerners, and Western culture. So the bottom line is, it is the West and the Westerners who must try and understand Africa, Africans and people of African descent from the inside. That is to say, from what the latter really are politically, culturally, scientifically, and not from what? From the inside, from the outside, the West and Westerners think they are or want them to be.
This is why we are warmly inviting the West and the Westerners and even some Africans and people of African descent to a little double war, a little double scientific war, which must lead them to the discovery of Africa and its diaspora. First, in a modern and contemporary world, as it is closer to us, than in antiquity in the pre-colonial period. Africa and the African diaspora in the modern and contemporary world. The extraordinary development of multifaceted means of communication, the internet, the media, the transportation means, among others, have produced a world that has become a global village. And contacts between the different peoples of the world are now more intense and more fruitful. However, Africa and its diaspora seem to be left behind in this beautiful dynamic, this beautiful human and sociological experience, which should have brought happiness to all the components of humanity. In this globalized, interconnected world, Africa and its diaspora are, paradoxically and unfairly, more than ever stigmatized, marginalized, and victims of multifaceted abuse from the rest of the world and from the West in particular. This is evidenced by the closure of European borders to African migrants, resulting in dozens of deaths each year, as was the case recently off the coast of Senegal in Mauritania. Anti-black racism, which is palpable everywhere in the West, including on sports grounds in France, Italy, Germany, England, to name but just these big countries. The brutal arrest and the gratu gratuitous claims of which African Americans are victims in the United States, and of which the most recent in shocking example, it a murder on May the 25th, 2020 of uh, George Floyd in atrocious conditions. But dozens of other young African Americans, men and women, have succumbed to the inhuman bullets of the American police. Some in their sleep, like Breonna Taylor in 2020, Rashad Brooks in 2020. Others at home, like Botham Jean, 2018, Stephen Clark, 2018, Oda Rosser, 2014, Michelle Cousseau, 2015, Matiana Jefferson, 2019, and Daniel Prue, 2020. The case. In fact, in the throes of an attack of dementia, he had got out naked onto the street and got killed. As we have seen in recent years, painful events have taken place in the world from which Africans and people of African descent have suffered. And they could be, could, could be qualified as based on race, show, and even more bluntly, racist considerations. These events and actions are, are taking place everywhere in the world. The situation risks having incalculable and unpredictable consequences on the relations between Africa and its diaspora on the one hand, and the rest of the world, that is the Western world, even though the African has shown himself to be a follower of peace and of violence, since always, with the example who have marked the recent history of humanity, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Ahmed Bamba. It is therefore high time for us to question altogether, and without complacency, Africa itself, the African diaspora in its diversity, as well as the relationships between Africa and the rest of the world. The relationship between Africa 
the, between the African race and the other races of the world. And I insist here on the concept of African race because I don't believe in any black race, in any white race, because I have never seen any of them. I've never seen any, any, any white race. I have never seen any black race. I have never seen any yellow race either. There are, these are creations of the mind that have contributed to exacerbating the misunderstandings between different, the different complementary components of the human race. We must therefore review the relationships that must exist between Africa and the rest of the world based not on stereotypes, cliches, and prejudices, but on historical reality. Such a scientific approach will allow us to grasp in its quintessence the, the uh, formidable contribution of Africa to the construction of the current cultural, economic, scientific, technological, and philosophical world we're living in. We all tend to portray Africa and its diaspora by emphasizing exclusively what they offer us today and all what they have also suffered in the past, especially from the 16th to the 20th century with slavery and colonization. Yet we have to admit that Africa did not exist only in those centuries. Africa has also shown other positive things. We must admit that criticizing the other from the outside has been for centuries of contact with Africa the attitude best shared in the West. Without having ever set foot in Africa, no met any African peoples, great and influential thinkers of the West. During the famous age of, in, of enlightenment, what a paradox, have attributed to those people in those societies prejudices, cliches, and stereotypes in the most gratuitous way. Example, Hegel, the great philosopher. Africa has no history. Another great European philosopher, Immanuel Kant. The Negroes are situated much lower than the Indians and the whites. And we have also other belittling refrains like the Negro is lazy, the Negro is dirty. However, when the West wanted to find skilled workers to cultivate their lands in the Americas, they really resorted to Africans after the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. But you may believe that he was discovered by Christopher Columbus, but in Africa we believe that America was discovered for the first time by an outsider from Africa. Emperor Bakary II from ancient Mali, who left his throne behind in 1311, but never came back. He said that I've, I've, gone, I've got to go and see what is behind the ocean. And he never came back. And he left West Africa with thousands of uh, millions and hundreds of ships and never came back. But this is another debate. We really must have the uh, scientific humility to recognize that it's too easy to judge from the outside and much more difficult to analyze from the inside. In the West, judgment of Africa for centuries has been an outsider judgment that doesn't hold historical reality. This seems to be the tragedy of the West with regard to its relationship with Africa. 
This is why I would like to solemnly invite the rest of the world, the West in particular, to take a new look at Africa as a whole, but above all, with scientific eyes, to get to know it better, understand it better, and perhaps appreciate it and love it. This misunderstanding of Africa on the part of the West is really pervasive. On a political level, for example, many Western observers who are really, in actual fact, so-called specialists of Africa, who know nothing about Africa, blame the lack of democracy on Africa, blame the mismanagement on Africans. But in actual fact, the mismanagement, the lack of democracy in Africa did not really stem from African practices. It is really, really rather the result of decolonization. Because when the Europeans decided to grant independence to their colonies in Africa, after having been asked to do so in actual fact by the UN, dominated by the USSR, the US, and China, who had no colonies, when they were forced to free their colonies after the Second World War, those countries, France and, the, and, and, and Britain, did not grant independence to the real leaders of Africa. They killed, they overthrew the best leaders, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Modibo Keita from Mali, Patrice Emery Lumumba from the Congo, Modibo Keita from Mali, uh, Milton Obote from Uganda, among others, and put there new leaders who would become the worst dictators Africa has ever had. And I'm giving you the list of them. Modibo Mobutu Seseko from the Congo, Musa Traore from Mali, Idi Amin Dada from Uganda, Echene Yadema from Togo, to name but a few. Those dicta dictators, as I said, are products of the West. They are not products of the African peoples, who are victims, rather. It should be noted that these maneuvers by the former colonial powers also got the better of the first attempts to set up large viable political groups in Africa on the eve of independence and in the early 1960s during the Cold War. The Federation of Mali, which was uh, to, 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 to put together the territories of Senegal, the French Sudan, Upper Volta, and Dahomey, was torpedoed by France, aided in this by Félix Oufé Boigny from Côte d'Ivoire. The East African Federation was Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, suffered also the same fate, was the opposition of Great Britain. So the balkanization of Africa, which uh, strongly, which has strongly awakened it, and which began with the Berlin Conference, I mentioned a while ago, 1884-1885, was cleverly maintained by the European powers with the aim of dividing the African peoples in order to better rule them. In other words, the ethnic political conflicts so much castigated, decried in contemporary Africa are in actual fact the direct consequences of colonization which has formed into states, conglomerates of antagonistic societies like Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, among others, and fragmented, fragmented homogeneous groups like Senegambia, in actual fact, 
the Empire of Mali to create from scratch unsustainable social political oddities like Senegal, Mali, Guinea Bissau, Guinea Conakry, the Gambia, who should have formed one state because they belong to the same empire of Mali. However, despite the enormous economic, political, and social, social difficulties bequeathed by the colonizer, African countries managed to pull themselves together and set up the Organization of African Unity in May 1963, and then the African Union in July 2002. Two organizations that have limited the scope of inter-African conflict and allowed access to independence for several countries such as Angola, Mozambique, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Namibia. And contrary to what Afro-pessimists of all stripes think, Africa has played a leading role in global geopolitics since 1960, even though it has no permanent member seat on the United Nations Security Council, dominated since October 1945 by three continents, Asia, Europe, and America. Africa has achieved this diplomatic feat, being very active in an aligned movement, which has succeeded in dismissing the specter of a third world war between the capitalist West and the communist East. Scientifically and technically speaking, in this modern and contemporary world, the West is getting the, 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 the lion's share, is grabbing the lion's share for themselves by posing us the exclusive modernizers of the world. However, an objective analysis of the various contributions to the modernization of our, of our world shows that without the many African inventors and scientists, and especially African-American ones, the world would not be modern. It may sound surprising, but this is the historical reality. In clear terms, without any jingoism, the world has been modernized by Africans, in, in particular by African Americans. Do you agree with me, ladies and gentlemen? If you don't, then allow me to give you a list and comment of, on the list of inventions of the invention by African Americans. And you will tell me what our world would be like today without those outstanding inventions. The main reason why the world is not fully aware of this historical reality is that the racial origin of Afro-American inventors is hardly disclosed. We have only uh, names. But those names do not really mention racial origins. We only talk about Latima, words, and we know how important the race issue is in America. Ethnicity is present in the document of all African American citizens and all Caucasian American citizens, in all Indian American citizen, in all Hispanic American citizen. Ladies and gentlemen, we will offer you a non-exhaustive list of 68 inventions with the years when the patent were granted to those African American inventors. And this shows that this is reality acknowledged by the highest American authorities. And those people, those inventors, have been acknowledged 
and admitted into the famous National Inventors Hall of Fame by the American authorities. And what is fabulous about it all, and further reinforces the genius of these inventors, is that most of them were slaves, or former slaves, who were in a very hostile environment. We're going to talk now about ancient and pre-colonial Africa to see what they looked to like before the world of today we're living in, this modern and contemporary world we're living in. As we have just demonstrated, but Africa and the rest of the world, about Africa and the African diaspora have shown is not very negative in this modern world. Africa and its diaspora are very present in all the concepts of modern nations through the participation of Africa in the construction and preservation of world peace and through the great contribution of African-American inventors to the modernization of the world. After this first effort to understand contemporary Africa and its diaspora from the inside, we're really asking the West to make the effort and uh, try and visit ancient and pre-colonial Africa in order to understand them, to understand it better from the inside. We all need to understand that history is a relentless spinning wheel in that part of the wheel of history that Africa and her diaspora have been showing us for centuries. Even if it's not in actual fact negative, it is not either the only face. Africa and the diaspora have shown more shining, much more glorious, and much more rewarding facets. But the rest of the world wants to keep its blunders, preventing them from seeing and appreciating Africa and her diaspora. All serious anthropologists, like Sir Job, have shown that humanity was born in Africa. That Africa is therefore the cradle of mankind. And this is the historical reality the West must include in its agendas. You see, Australopithecus afferensis, discovered in Ethiopia in 1974 by a team of European and Asian and African researchers, is over three million years old. And even if it is not totally bipedal. It doesn't walk on its two feet only. The appearance of this anthropomorphic being in Africa proves that it was in Africa that the, the, a creature close to modern man appeared for the first time. And Homo sapiens sapiens, 300 thousand years old, was also discovered in Africa, and especially, precisely, in modern Morocco. It is established that the likes of this man migrated into the other parts of the world, the other continents, and gave birth to what we wrongfully call races, as if they were from antagonistic backgrounds. Whereas the historical reality is, is that 
all those races of humanity are emanations, fragments from the African race, made dark black by the hot and dry tropical climate. It is in fact the different climatic and environmental conditions which prevails at the level of the different geographical entities of the fragmented globe which have shaped all the races of the world and not so-called human wills. In less nuanced terms, we call human races today black races, white races, yellow races, as if they were creations, inventions, by given goldsmith. Creations, invention, some of which are inferior and others superior. As if they were machines and tools made by Homo sapiens sapiens. This is not the reality. And I do not really believe in races. I believe in humanity. This is the reason why I don't really understand their reserve spend their time proclaiming they're being proud to be black, they're being proud to be white, they're being proud to be yellow. What have I personally done to be this color? I did nothing to be the way I am. So why should I be proud to be what I am? How can I grab nature or God's action for myself and then celebrate myself for that. This is ignorance. So an objective analysis of pre-colonial Africa shows that the celebrated and denigrated races of the world are all fragments of the African race. And recent researchers have demonstrated, researchers who are not African but Chinese, that even the Chinese who are so different from Africans and who today uh, the leaders, the economic leaders of the world, those Chinese, their ancestors were Negroids. In the same way as the inhabitants, the present day inhabitants of the West, of Europe, of America, have issued from Negroid ancestors. This is the reality. Researchers of all races of the world have also represented that ancient Egypt and Nubia were inhabited by Africans. That is quite noble. And that as a result of the dislocation of these empires with assaults from Europe and the Orient. Their populations are now scattered all over the continent of Africa. And as proofs, the present day inhabitants of West Africa, the Wallops, the Fulanis, the Serer, among others, still keep linguistic backgrounds linguistic vestiges from ancient Egypt and uh, cultural vestiges from ancient Egypt. And the example I'm giving here 
is third day, eighth day, and fortieth day funerals that are today still present in my communities in West Africa, in the Wolof community, in the Seder community, in the Fulani Seder community, and in almost all the West African communities. And we know how great those two entities were, ancient Nubia and ancient Egypt, culturally, scientifically, and technically. And this has been acknowledged by the most outstanding European philosophers, Herodotus, Pythagoras, Aristotle, who are the fathers of Western civilization and who have acknowledged that they were strongly influenced by philosophers from ancient Egypt. So we cannot talk about Western civilization without mentioning that it has been strongly influenced by Egyptian civilization, African civilization. Being therefore unquestionably the cradle of mankind, Africa consequently produced the first oral literature in the world. So the literature of Africa is the oldest literature in the world. Not only is oral literature, but its written literature is all the, 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 richest, the oldest literature in the world. Because one of the oldest literatures in the world is found in ancient Egypt, not written with hieroglyphs, but was more sophisticated, more refined script. And there is this, lit this little literature, written literature, is at least 2,000 years old because it was produced 2,000 years before Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm asking this provocative, provocative and friendly question. What was the literature, the written literature of Europe and the West like at the time, that is 2,000 years before Jesus Christ, some would say, in the cradle? In the scientific field also, the oldest mathematical tool you can see here was discovered in Central Africa. It is called the Ishango bone, which is 20,000 years old, and proves that mathematical sciences were born in Africa, south of the Sahara. This tool has 168 notches spread over three columns and grouped together intentionally, and the result of which suggest advanced mathematical knowledge. And the mathematical analysis of this object reveals the mastery by the Bantu of Central Africa of the time of arithmetic sequences, duplications, multiplications, and subtractions, as well as the knowledge of prime numbers. We showed then that it was in Africa that mathematics were born, that abstraction, which is the highest attitude in mathematics, was born. And we have got also to acknowledge that after the fall of the dictator, Sumanguru Kanti. This is on the political arena. 
In 1235, following the Battle of Kirina, which opposed um, the um, dictator Sumanguru Kante to Sunjata Keita and his allies from several regions in West Africa, the, the next year, in 1235, Sunjata Keita convened a conference, what can be called a national conference. He convened all the leaders in West Africa who had issued from the collapse of the Empire of Ghana to discuss and see how to produce a new constitution. And the meeting took place in a place called the Kurukon, and this is the reason why the document comprising 44 articles is known as the Kurukon Fuga Charter, which is one of the most, if not the most advanced constitution because it deals with children's rights, women's rights, the rights of slaves, peaceful cohabitation, protection of the environment, marriage, divorce, among others. And I believe that the only oldest charter produced by man was the 1215 Magna Carta in England. But this one is less holistic. Whereas the Monday Charter is really obviously more comprehensive. Now we're talking about very quickly slavery and colonization. To better understand what happened, why colonization, why slavery? Slavery could take place in Africa for reasons related to the global context of the time following the discovery of the new world by Christopher Columbus, but would others would say by Bakari II, as I said a while ago. But it should be noted that the Westerners, Europeans, and Americans involved in the exploitation of the, those lands they discovered in the new uh, world, they first resorted to white people from Europe, prisoners from Europe called indented slaves. But as their number was not very big, they think about other options and they said, okay, we've got to go to India. But India was far away from Europe and America. So Africa was really the ideal position, the ideal choice, the ideal option, because of its position, its geographical position. Not very far from Europe, not very far from America. And having also experienced farmers, despite the fact that the Westerners believe that black people are lazy, they really resorted to them to farm the lands in the Americas. Because in actual fact, most of uh, those African American taken from Africa, they were farmers or cattle breeders. What you also must uh, consider is the political context which made slavery easier. We have said that most of the big empires in West Africa had collapsed. And I am really a believer that without the collapse of the empire of Ghana in the 11th century, the collapse of the empire of Mali in the 15th century, the collapse of the empire of Songhai and Jolof in the 
16th century, there wouldn't be any slavery. But when the Europeans came to Africa, they did not find any state, any viable state, with viable strong armies and economies. And this is the reason why there was, in actual fact, nobody to face them. Nobody. And this is really what made slavery easy. And this, what made slavery easy is also what made colonization easy. Because when the Europeans came to Africa to colonize the territories in order to get the raw material they needed, they had no authorities, no authorities to oppose them. But many Africans fought in order to protect Africa from slave hunters and from the colonizers. And this is something really have got to bear in mind. When the slave hunters came to Africa, there was no real state to face them. There was small kingdoms. I give the example of the Empire of Mali. It comprised in the 14th, 15th century, almost all the West African countries who are members of the ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West Africa, comprising 15 states. The only states, the only model states who were not members of the uh, uh, Mali Empire are present-day Ghana and present-day Nigeria. But present-day Senegal, present-day um, Cote d'Ivoire, present-day uh, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Conakry, Mali, etc. All of them were part and parcel of this big empire. So Africans were powerless when the slave hunters came. But it is really not normal to believe that Africans were selling Africans. Why do you have to be selling your brothers and sisters? This is a big debate to clarify. Because in the 15th century, 16th century, uh, 17th century, 18th century, and even 19th century, early 19th century, there was in actual fact no sense of belonging to the same race. The different social political entities in Africa were rather rivals fighting each other. In actual fact, this was the, the reality, and it was a reality also in Europe. So it was only in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, after having suffered the same way from slavery and colonization, that African peoples started thinking about getting together. And it started in America, because it was after the conference, the Berlin Conference in 1884, 1885, that African Americans, um, uh, intellectuals, got together and uh, protested for the first time against the colonization in Africa. So this is something very important we have got to understand and know. Colonization was abolished because the slave was no longer necessary. Colonization was uh, dismantled and independence granted because of the First and then the Second World War. Because it was the countries who had defeated 
Germany, who had decided at the UN to, to force France and Britain to grant independence to their countries, to their colonies in Africa and in Asia. And decolonization started in Asia in the 1940s, almost immediately after the Second World War. And then decolonization also started in Africa in the 50s, in, 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 the, in the 50s and 60s. So there is a link between decolonization and the first and then the Second World War, and especially the Second World War. It is something we have got to understand. If the Europeans had put an end to slavery because of the humanism, why did they resort after that to colonization? Because there is no difference whatsoever between slavery and colonization. There are two aspects of the same thing. They are really the same thing, all of which based on exploitation. And this is something African American and people of African descent have got to understand. Because some years ago I was in the United States of America and my friend, this outstanding African American poet, Niki Giovanni, told me, Gorgi, I know who sold me. And he was thinking about my ancestors. Whereas my ancestors had suffered when his ancestors were taken away from Africa or were not even their brothers or sisters because of the context I talked about a while ago. So we have got really to reconsider the relationship between Africans and African Americans and the people of African descent. Because this misunderstanding must be stopped. We have got to face the music and understand that there is no difference, as I said a while ago, whatsoever between slavery and colonization. They are the same. So why Africa have decided to accept colonization? Africa did not accept colonization. So Africa did not accept slavery. And many Africans fought, and there are examples, against the enslavement of Africans, in the same way as many Africans fought against colonization. And this is the reality. But we have also got to consider that the deportation of Africans from the continent into the Americas and the other part of the world has created new cultural entities. We belong to the same race, the African race, not the black race. So we have got to understand that this separation has produced new, different cultural entities, which are of course complementary, because as I said, the key issue is being African. The key issue is being African. So we have got to understand it that way and uh, consider that the Africans outside Africa have cultures we have got to respect as Africans. In the same way as, as African Americans, uh, that people of African descent in the rest of the world must consider also that the Africans have a culture, have a society or societies that may be different from there. But what must put them together in the same fate? 
That is the fate of being African, being African, having the same destiny. No African in Africa would be happy as long as Africans in the rest of the world are unhappy. And I think that this is the other way around. Now, to conclude, the objective of our inaugural conference was to seek to humanize the relationships, sometimes very conflicting, between Africa and her diaspora on the one hand and the rest of the world, especially the West on the other. And I believe that the paper has tried to demonstrate that the West must have the humility to reconsider its attitude towards Africa and her diaspora. Understand that whether you are Chinese, American, British, French, German, you have links with Africa. And those links, nobody can sever them because they are based on humanity. They are based on our co co common humanity. The conference has shown that Africa has contributed in every respect to the development of the world, political development of the world, the peaceful development of the world, the cultural development of the world, the scientific development of the world, the technological development of the world, with the great contribution, the contributions made by African Americans that have modernized the world. I'm not exaggerating. So, I would like to thank once again the organizers of this conference who have given me the opportunity to talk to you and I would be really very happy to exchange with you during the following days. Thank you. Have a great day.